Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, friends, colleagues. Um, I'm Chris Byer. I direct the Center for Public Health and Human Rights here at the Bloomberg School, and uh, delighted to welcome you to our fall event and to this very uh, special presentation. Um, I want to also welcome and thank again our uh, advisory committee members. We met earlier this afternoon uh, with uh, some of the affiliated faculty and students uh, working with center projects and uh, I want to thank them all for their time and coming and welcome them also uh, to this afternoon. We're really honored, um, people always say that we're honored, but we really are honored uh, and delighted to have with us uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Eric Schwartz. Um, Eric is the Assistant Secretary for Population, Refugees and Migration and he is really has been for many years a champion uh, of the world's most vulnerable people. And he's something else which is really very special too, which is that he is a model of a committed public servant. Um, he's worked uh, on these issues inside of government in the Clinton administration, now in the Obama administration under Secretary Clinton, and also in the periods when he's been out of government and has always had immense fidelity uh, to human rights issues uh, and to working with a human rights framework. Um, I'm not going to get into biographical details because Dean Clagg will introduce um, Eric to you in a moment, um, but I do want to just say uh, a, a few things um, that I think are really very important, um, and, and I want to thank Eric for his service for all of these years uh, because he really has been uh, such an extraordinary uh, champion for these issues. So how many branches of the U.S. government have in their mission statement that one of their key goals is to ease suffering? I think PRM must be the only one. Uh, and that certainly is a mission statement uh, that speaks volumes about Eric Schwartz. Or how about uh, to resolve the plight of persecuted and uprooted people around the world? Another really extraordinary mission. And I think that that makes the Bureau under Eric uh, really a natural partner for public health institutions uh, like ours and like so many others. Because of course that is so much our fundamental mission. Uh, and that's why uh, we really feel that there's tremendous synergy uh, in having Eric with us. Now as many of you know, uh, our center here at Hopkins has also had long-standing engagements with human rights, public health, and with the democratic uh, and ethnic forces in Burma. Secretary Schwartz has, has been a, a true friend um, to the people of Burma for their many decades of suffering. Um, and PRM, uh, under his leadership, uh, now has programs for internally displaced persons in Burma, Burmese migrants and refugees in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Bangladesh. Uh, so they really have an extensive uh, involvement. But we also, uh, I'm happy to say, have with us another true friend of Burma, um, and that is my great friend and mentor, the Executive Director of the Institute for Asian Democracy, Michelle Bohanna. And uh, so Michelle is with us today, and thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, happily, um, uh, of course, Michelle uh, has been a person who has worked with and supported for so many years uh, Da Aung San Suu Kyi, the uh, democratically elected leader of that country. And of course, as we all know, uh, she is again free as of November 13th. And uh, so that makes this an especially happy occasion, I must say. That's an applause line, by the way. Yay! <laughs> um, tremendous, tremendous. Um, I should say, in the interest of full disclosure uh, and transparency, uh, that uh, the center here at Hopkins uh, actually recently has been awarded uh, a grant from uh, the Bureau, from PRM. Uh, I'm not an investigator on that grant, so I have no conflict of interest of my own to declare, but uh, we are really delighted uh, about that uh, grant. And let me just say that it involves Len Rubenstein uh, here at the School of Public Health, um, Dr. Alex Vu from Emergency Medicine across the street at the School of Medicine, and uh, Dr. Nancy Glass from the School of Nursing, uh, and our own Andrea Wirtz from the center. 
um, and Sonal Singh, who is both a, um, uh, a new faculty member at the School of Medicine and a PhD student here in epidemiology. Um, so that's kind of the model of the work that we want to do involving medicine, nursing, and public health. And that project is going to be developing a screening tool for sexual and gender-based violence in refugee and conflict populations um, in Ethiopia and Colombia. And it's a collaboration with the UN High Commission for Human Rights. Um, so uh, we're really thrilled that that academic partnership is underway. Um, and it's also wonderful to say that another faculty member uh, at the school, Court Robinson, also uh, has recently been awarded uh, an important project uh, for, with PRM support uh, working with refugee uh, displaced populations in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. Um, so that also is, is really um, a wonderful thing. Um, now, earlier today, uh, we announced at the, at the advisory board meeting um, the uh, first recipients of our uh, first student research funding awards uh, for public health and human rights. And I'm happy to say that we funded four of those awards. Uh, some of the awardees are, are here in the audience, and I uh, just want to take a moment uh, to uh, name them. Uh, and, uh, and then ask you uh, at the end of that to join me in congratulating them. So the four winners are uh, Shivani Patel, who's going to be uh, looking at exposure to and trauma uh, um, after the Gujarat communal riots in India in 2002, and she's going to be mentored by uh, Susan Sherman, affiliated faculty member uh, with the center. Pammy Crawford is going to be doing a secondary data analysis of Tanzanian and Thai data related to ARV uptake and use, mentored by uh, David Chalantano and Bob Lawrence. I think I saw, uh, oh, hey Bob, welcome. Um, uh, Anjali Kohli is going to uh, be doing a mixed method study uh, of family mediation and mental health of survivors of sexual violence uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, mentored by uh, Nancy Glass from the School of Nursing. Uh, and Antonia Petit, uh, a PhD student in, epidemi uh, in health behavior and society, uh, is going to be doing qualitative research looking at stigma and discrimination in healthcare access and HIV risks for transgendered adults in Baltimore. So at least one of these human rights projects uh, will be uh, in our own backyard, and she is going to be mentored by Danielle German, also of HBS. So uh, please join me in honoring this <laughs> colleague. So the human rights movement uh, writ large really has a true leader uh, in Eric Schwartz. But I have to say uh, that I think perhaps even more importantly, uh, the people we all seek to serve, refugees, civilian populations trapped in conflict, the displaced, uh, have a true ally in Eric Schwartz. Uh, and arguably, of course, they're a lot more important than the academics and uh, researchers in the human rights movement. And I think uh, you know, that he has always uh, put them first in his thinking and in his efforts. I think that's true of just about everybody else in this room as well. Uh, we really share that fundamental orientation uh, to try and alleviate the suffering of the vulnerable. And um, I, think, uh, I think that that means really, hopefully, we, we, we have a shared uh, mission and vision. I'm going to ask Dean Clagg to come up and, and introduce Eric. Uh, and just while he's stepping up to the podium, uh, I just want to thank the dean again for all of his support and effort and also for his tremendous staff uh, in helping pull this event together. So Mike, please. Thanks. Well, I, I too want to thank uh, the, the center's advisory board for coming today and for having a great meeting beforehand. And, Congratulate Chris and everybody involved with the center on the incredible progress you've made and the contributions in, in a really short time. So, so Chris has already communicated the passion and admiration that people who know Eric Schwartz feel for him and for his work. So I'm just going to fill in some of the details here. Uh, he was confirmed by the Senate as Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration in, uh, on June uh, 19th. 2009 and was sworn in uh, about a month later. Prior to that appointment, he was the executive director of the Connect US Fund, a foundation NGO partnership focused on foreign policy and international affairs. And before that, from 2005 to 2007, he served as the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan's deputy special envoy for its tsunami recovery. And in that role, he worked under the UN Special Envoy, former President Bill Clinton and his former boss, to promote coordination, accountability to donors, 
and beneficiaries and best practices in the recovery effort. In 2003, he served as a, in the uh, UN Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights after the then High Commissioner, Sergio Vero de Mello, asked him to join the organization. In the year following de Mello's 2003 assassination in Baghdad, Baghdad, Eric served as second ranking official at UNHCR headquarters, overseeing a variety of budgeting and planning activities. From 2001 to 2003, he held fellowships at the Woodrow Wilson Center, the U.S. Institute of Peace, and the Council on Foreign uh, Relations. And as a senior fellow at the Council, he directed the Independent Task Force on Post-Conflict Iraq. From 1993 to 2001, he served, as the National, uh, served at the National Security Council, ultimately as senior director and special assistant to the president for multilateral and human, humanitarian affairs, where he played a central role in managing U.S. responses on a range of peacekeeping, humanitarian, and refugee issues, including efforts in East Timor, Sierra Leone, Northern Iraq, Vietnam, Central America, and Kosovo. He holds a law degree from NYU, a Master of Public Affairs degree from the Woodrow Wilson School of Princeton University, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science from my old stamping grounds at the State University of New York at Binghamton. So please join me in welcoming Eric Schwartz. Don't worry about the limp. It was a uh, uh, it was a um, <clears throat> a tennis injury on the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, when you do anything with, if you have an identical twin brother as I do, um, sometimes your level of competitive competitiveness exceeds your physical capabilities, and uh, that's what happened. Let's hope that stays. Um, well, thank you. Uh, for, first, I, I I have to thank the school of public health uh, on behalf of my parents uh, uh, because for the first time in, I noticed uh, in, in the, in the uh, <clears throat> brochure, it says Eric Schwartz, JD, MPA. So for the first time in 30 years, I've got something out of my law degree. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, but on a, on a, on a serious note, uh, I am deeply honored to have the opportunity uh, to <clears throat> speak with you uh, uh, today. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor on so many different levels. Um, main, uh, in large measure, uh, you know, when, when Chris asked me, when I got the email from Chris uh, about this event, I just, I didn't even know what the event was, but it was an invitation from Chris, so I hit reply and I said, yes, whatever it is, I'll do it. Um, because you know here at here at Johns Hopkins, I'm sure you have several, but Chris is um, you know he's a hero of uh, public health and human rights and and um, has made such a difference uh, uh, on these issues and so we're so deeply grateful and you know he's uh, I have another dear friend here, an old friend Court Robinson, who also has done such important work on these issues and and um, you know those of us who have had the opportunity to play a role. And, and many of you are students um, on um, on uh, on these kinds of issues. You know, it's it's a really it's just a great honor to 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 have somebody you know pay you a salary, albeit a modest salary, uh, to you know to do this kind of work, to wake up in the morning and to try to make the world a better place. It's an honor and it's a luxury, but it's also completely uh, doable. I mean, there's nothing that prevents any of you uh, from charting the same kind of course. Uh, it really just depends on what you believe is very important. Uh, and sometimes what you believe is very important is not necessarily what a lot of people around you believe uh, is very important. But, but you know, I think there's, uh, um, there's, there's nothing, if, if there's any place in the world you ought to be able to think about um, uh, charting that kind of course, I think it's in an institution like this one. So I'm, I'm delighted to be asked to give this presentation. I also, before I start, I also want to thank Beth, where are you? Ah, there she is. Uh, Beth uh, Elizabeth Schlachter, who is our public affairs officer and also collaborated very closely 
with me on <clears throat> the talk I'm about to give. Uh, just uh, in, in terms of setting your own uh, uh, level of toler tolerance and patience, it, it's about 20 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> um, I, I, I want to thank again the Center uh, for um, uh, organizing this event and for its work on uh, human rights uh, and public health. Uh, in particular, the work of the Center on the interests of, on behalf of displaced Burmese, uh, provides an inspired example of how organizations and advocates, through creative and flexible approaches, can effectively address some of the most challenging uh, humanitarian issues that we face today. Um, before, uh, before I begin, I think I've now said that several times, uh, <clears throat> but I'm into my 20 minutes, so don't <laughs> worry. Um, I, I think it's fitting that I note uh, the yesterday's passing of, uh, of former Congressman uh, Stephen Solars, uh, a, a champion of human rights, uh, democracy, and the interests of vulnerable people. Um, as some of you may know, although most of you are too young, maybe, um, Steve served in the House of Representatives for nine terms, uh, beginning in 1975, and throughout uh, the 18 years that he served, he was one of the most active members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, ultimately chairing its subcommittee on Asian and Pacific Affairs. He was a master at the use of all of the instruments of congressional power. <clears throat> and he used those instruments to promote positive change. Victims of conflict, uh, victims of abuse, victims of neglect, whether they were from Burma, uh, which was the object of m much of his attention, whether they were from Mozambique, Haiti, or many other places. He defended refugees, he worked tirelessly, uh, to stem piracy in the Gulf of Thailand, uh, to rescue Vietnamese boat people, and to safeguard uh, the lives of Africans, Central Americans, Poles, and many other uh, uh, displaced and disenfranchised people. Uh, his persistent advocacy of the, of, of the interests of the dispossessed and the disenfranchised uh, will be forever, I think, a model for those who seek to make the world a better place. And it's a model for us. It's a model for us in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration, where protecting the most vulnerable must be at the core of our work. This is our mission, uh, due both to the moral imperative of saving lives and also because it enhances our ability to promote reconciliation, to promote security, to promote well-being in circumstances where, where despair and misery not only, not only threatens stability, but also can threaten uh, the interests of our country. But how, how do we promote these kinds of interests, the well-being of the most vulnerable, when circumstances on the ground in so many places make access to populations such a challenge. Ideally, our international and non-governmental partners should have full and easy access to victims of conflict. In some cases, international partners supplement or otherwise assist the work of national, regional, or local institutions. In Jordan and Syria, for example, uh, Iraqi refugees receive uh, education benefits from the state, but those are supplemented by support from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and other, um, uh, and other organizations. In, in Colombia, um, the government there is the major provider of support for internally displaced persons who number in the millions. But there again, the United States and others do what we can to assist. And, and even in those cases where governments are without the, the, the means uh, to, or the capacity to meet the basic needs of displaced within their borders, they are often prepared, those governments are often prepared to permit, to permit access to international and non-governmental organizations 
to provide protection and assistance on terms and conditions that are acceptable and that are workable. But what, but what about those circumstances where governments demonstrate little inclination to meet the basic needs of the displaced and don't even, don't even have possible processes of responsible management that would permit easy partnerships with international organizations that want to help. This question, of course, is most compelling in the case of uh, internally displaced persons uh, to whom national governments have really the greatest responsibility, the responsibility to their own citizens. Now, writing off affected populations in these circumstances doesn't seem to be a very attractive or acceptable option or one that even accords with international humanitarian principles. So in, in these kinds of cases, what actions uh, can concerned outsiders, donor governments, international organizations, NGOs, what can they do to save and safeguard lives and set the stage for, for sustainable development? Just what lessons can we, can we learn, can we draw about effective response in such, in such situations? Well, what better place to begin to look for an answer uh, to, those, to that question than the Bloomberg School of Public Health's uh, Mobile Obstetrics Medics Project for Burma. Did I, did I get the phrase right? Yes, okay, good. Um, an example of how innovative approaches can be applied to addressing humanitarian needs in really the most difficult of, of, of settings. Between 2005 and 2008, practitioners in this project documented a tenfold increase in the proportion of women in their survey population who are attended at delivery by health workers who have been trained to provide emergency obstetric care. Over the same period, the unmet need for contraceptives decreased by 35% among the survey population and there was a significant increase in the number of pregnant women who received postnatal visits, mosquito nets, and iron supplements uh, to prevent anemia. So how, how did this project obtain these results? And, I, I, and again, what general lessons might we draw from this experience about the provision of assistance and assisting in the building of capacity in fragile and failed states. Let me offer just a few observations. When I give talks, I like to work with lists. So I usually try to get to 10. I think on this one I got to about eight. Um, but let me, let me draw observations uh, from my own review of this project um, in very small type of what this project document was, I should add. Um, um, as well as from my own, my own experiences in, in related areas. First, um, in environments involving fragile or failed states, we may be able to adjust our concept of presence without sacrificing an ongoing or even a, a pervasive role. In the case of, of your project, access didn't depend on large capital intensive investment in fixed facilities or even smaller uh, fixed sites whose establishment might have required uh, very complicated negotiations with national, provincial, and local authorities or security guarantees that would not have been uh, achievable or any number of other obstacles. In such situations, a well-trained and dispersed network of providers who know the terrain and the communities uh, can be a highly effective means of empowered healthcare delivery. In your program, I guess the acronym is MOM, um, community-based organizations were trained to provide maternal and reproductive health services uh, in their communities in Eastern Burma. This created a network of people with both the commitment and technical, linguistic and intercultural skills to reach vulnerable and isolated populations with both information 
and with services. This core of trained professionals work in mobile units, taking health care to isolated communities, rather than requiring individuals to come to congregate at a centrally um, uh, located health center. Second observation, that a difficult operating environment should not prevent providers from adhering to best humanitarian and protection uh, principles in the delivery of assistance. This can be critical, this observation, if programs in uncertain environments uh, are to be sustainable, if they are to build confidence among beneficiaries, and if they are to lay the groundwork for future broad-based development. In fact, a healthcare delivery program uh, in and of itself is evidence of this basic proposition that vulnerable populations in fragile and failed states in uncertain environments require much more than simply food and shelter. Third, third observation, that while a community-based approach in involving local providers uh, can be of great benefit because it can firmly connect providers over time to the recipients of services. Significant and long-lasting benefits won't emerge in the absence of dedicated um, uh, technical assistance, dedicated training programs. As in the case of your project and its tiered approach involving three levels of health workers, training programs must also be coupled uh, with intelligent and effective processes for the, for the delivery of services. This leads uh, to a fourth point, that local capacity building as well as other developmental principles should, whenever possible, be built into programs of humanitarian assistance. This point was brought home to me most powerfully uh, in Asia between 2005 and 2007 when I served, as the Dean mentioned, as the UN Secretary General's uh, Deputy Special Envoy for Tsunami Recovery. A major goal of aid providers, in short, should be to put themselves out of a job. And with so much money and so many outside organizations flooding the Asian region in the aftermath of the tsunami, uh, that goal certainly seemed to me to be attainable uh, and worth achieving. Fifth observation, service providers operating in environments without public services, without in infrastructure, must dedicate themselves nonetheless to adequate data collection uh, to avoid severe and, and, um, and crippling information deficits. As difficult as it is to obtain basic information in locations with very limited um, uh, infrastructure of, of any and all types, uh, basic data collection is absolutely essential. Uh, the mobile obstetric medics program uh, its network of providers uh, ha has been trained to collect information on public health and related concerns. And this information in Burma or in any place where the government does not generally have reliable information is critical for shaping programmatic interventions at the most local of levels. And, for, and, and also it's critical for informing um, uh, international uh, um, uh, organizations informing their judgments about possible support for such programs. Sixth, um, when in doubt about the best uh, programming options in environments of uncertainty, um, you can't go wrong by focusing on the well-being of women. Of course, we can't minimize uh, the possible complications of programming that might challenge, as such programming sometimes does, programming that might challenge existing power structures. <coughs> but the benefits of smartly conceived programs for women are overwhelming. Ensuring the availability of reproductive health in diverse emergency setting 
is a critical aspect of providing for the overall health of populations, not only in Burma, but around the world. There is such a strong link between reproductive health in a community and that community's ability to recover from crisis and calamity. Family planning, reproductive health, they are indispensable to the health of women. They're indispensable. Uh, the health of women is critical to the stability of families and communities. And women's health and participation in efforts to rebuild after a crisis are essential elements of achieving economic and social recovery and development worldwide. In addition, I should say it's not in my remarks, but self-sufficiency programs for women are also critically important because the data seems to suggest that the fruits of, the, of that work gets plowed back into families as opposed to liquor <laughs> and other uh, um, diversions. Um, seventh, uh, because unconventional humanitarian aid programs will in many cases operate across borders. An effective program of assistance should, if at all possible, be tailored to help promote uh, regional well-being and regional stability, or at least should be tailored with an awareness of this dynamic, of this issue. Obviously, the benefits of a program in one country shouldn't come at the expense of the people of another, and negative effects like that can create opposition among governments in neighboring countries. In this respect, the Mobile Obstetric Medics pro Project likely has significant benefits for the region and for Thailand in particular. The availability of otherwise absent medical services within Burma has no doubt enabled many to avoid the need to travel to Thailand and to join that country's population of undocumented Burmese. Moreover, the government of Thailand has of late uh, emphasized the importance of capacity building among Burmese. So this program seems uh, quite consistent with the government of Thailand's own policy, uh, stated policy perspectives. And finally, uh, final observation. Maybe I got to nine, I don't know. No, I only got to eight. Um, during questions and answers, we could come up with two more. Um, in the absence of effective policing and law enforcement, aid providers need to consider promoting a range of options to safeguard security and therefore ensure the humanitarian space necessary for effective assistance delivery. In states that face ongoing challenges relating to security and the rule of law, what, what should be the role of domestic and international security force in ensuring not only humanitarian space, but protection, protection of displaced people? Uh, to be sure, uh, in the case of Burma, this question may not be all that relevant under current circumstances. But it is relevant elsewhere in the world and, 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 and bears some discussion. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, how can we bolster the role of UN peacekeepers um, uh, in, in, in providing uh, protection? And, and how should the international community best promote security sector reform for Congolese forces, which may, in fact, represent the, bo the best hope over time of providing more than a modicum of security uh, for terribly vulnerable, internally displaced persons in the Congo. And with the withdrawal from Chad, uh, from which I've just returned, so it's kind of on my mind, uh, with the withdrawal of Chad, from Chad, of the UN peacekeeping mission, MINERCAT, uh, the UN mission uh, in the Central African Republic in Chad, that's what MINERCAT stands for, how can we best support the effort to build capacity of local forces that uh, the government of Chad has affirmed uh, will play a role in protecting Darfuri refugees who are in Chad. And finally, and uh, not unimportantly, 
how do we best ensure that security forces don't misuse or appropriate assistance for their own non-humanitarian purposes? Now, these are all important questions, but unfortunately, in some fragile and difficult environments, they're, they're largely irrelevant. Um, um, uh, and, 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 and I think these questions, these issues, when you think about a place like Burma, I think they highlight what may be the most critical point in this area, at least with respect to the subject of this, of this talk, dealing with very uncertain environments, fragile and failed states. And that is that in many circumstances, security forces will simply be unable or unwilling to promote effectively either humanitarian space or to promote the protection of vulnerable populations. And when that's the case, um, concerned humanitarians must grapple with the question of other strategies to ensure that people can be reached and people can be assisted. And this is a very complicated issue. Uh, it's this could be the subject of a whole other talk. But it seems to me that one essential requirement for creating a semblance of stability in an insecure environment is creating, is creating trust among local populations in which the aid providers operate. And in this respect, the mobile obstetric medics project, I think, may offer very valuable lessons. So those are my eight or so observations. No, no situations are exactly alike. But these and other factors may be of some use uh, in informing efforts to provide assistance and protection to vulnerable populations in states that have very little indigenous uh, capacity, uh, very limited access uh, for outside uh, um, assistance providers, and other obstacles to traditional means of providing aid. In Somalia, for example, the strong presence of the militant group Al-Shabaab has made it extremely difficult for international humanitarian organizations to access the south central region of the country and to provide uh, critical assistance. As we think about future strategies to get aid into south central Somalia, um, I think we could benefit by some of the methods used by the mobile obstetric medics project, and in particular the emphasis on the extens extensive use of community-based organizations and the avoidance uh, of a specific presence uh, in the region. In Haiti, where our bureau operates assistance near the border with the Dominican Republic, far from Port-au-Prince, uh, at least Haiti's a pretty small country, so nothing's far from Port-au-Prince, but relatively speaking, um, far from Port-au-Prince, some of the, of, of the project's lessons in training and use of local providers seem particularly relevant, especially given the limited capability of the central government in Haiti and its limited connection uh, to more remote border areas. In Chad, which I just mentioned, a difficult security environment in the eastern part of the country, which is now host to some 270,000 Darfuri refugees, um, is encouraging international non-governmental organizations uh, to limit their direct involvement in in assistance activities, and instead to begin to rely more heavily on refugee camp local committees. Here again, uh, lessons from your experience, the experience of the uh, MOM program uh, on, uh, relating to community development, I think could lead to valuable, uh, valuable insights that could inform policy. And in Afghanistan, where where the government has struggled with the effective reintegration of millions of returnees from Pakistan, regional stability should be and is uh, a major factor in our programs of support for the return of Afghans uh, to Pakistan. So I think the work you're doing here uh, has implications and lessons for our broader efforts uh, in these areas, in, in getting assistance effectively, in a sustainable way, to places that are, frankly, inhospitable uh, uh, to outsiders. In closing, uh, I want to be sure that I haven't overemphasized these broader lessons at the expense of recognizing 
uh, the signal accomplishment of, of your project. The effective provision of reproductive health services in an extraordinarily challenging environment. For this, uh, we salute you and your important work. There's an old proverb. I didn't know it was an old proverb until Beth pointed it out to me, but here it is. Um, so you can Google it and see if it's right. But there is an old proverb that says, when there is health, there is hope. I, I think you probably all know that since this is your field. In one of the most difficult environments in the world, your mobile obstetric project shows us all that there is indeed hope for a better future, even in very nasty places. And for this, I express my appreciation uh, to Johns Hopkins University, to the center, and all the staff members of this important, of this important project. Rest assured that the United States government remains committed to promoting the reproductive health and human rights of displaced populations in Burma and around the world. Thank you. So now what do we do? <laughs> Thank you for a very uh, inspiring talk. Uh, toward the end of your eight points, you talked about uh, security for creating humanitarian space. What role, if any, can the International Criminal Court play in securing that humanitarian space? Is it too blunt an instrument? Is it too threshold too high? It's a, tr it's a, it's a tricky issue. It's not a tricky question. It's a very straight, straightforward question. It's a tricky issue. Um, and because I have, um, I have um, occupied um, uh, kind of both uh, disciplines in my career, human rights, international human rights advocacy and international humanitarian, um, uh, in international humanitarian issues, um, you know, I can see it from both perspectives. I think you guys are familiar with... Um, 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 the tension. What's actually so remarkable about Chris's work is that he seems to have figured out how to manage uh, uh, um, uh, this tension and, um, and check both the human rights box and the humanitarian assistance box at the same time. And I think that's a remarkable accomplishment. I mean, it really is. Um, I even think it deserves a round of applause, so I'll give it to him. Um, um, what, 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 what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, um, in the simplest, let me just tell you in the simplest of terms, okay? In, Su in, um, in Sudan, um, uh, uh, the head of state, uh, um, President Bashir, um, has been indicted by the ICC. Um, in, the, um, in the wake of that indictment, Bashir kicked out, I don't know, I think about eight of the most um, important humanitarian uh, organizations uh, from um, uh, from uh, Darfur, I believe, uh, and um, even organizations that had nothing to do with the International Criminal Court. So, so the, the the simple answer is that there's this tension, and humanitarians who need access and need to um, uh, need to uh, engage with authorities to get to get access, to have permission to be there, et cetera. Um, you know, humanitarians are very nervous about these sorts of mechanisms um, um, and, and, and would argue that they, don't, that, 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 that they haven't helped. Um, I think um, human rights uh, organizations would argue that, yeah, in the short term, there may be some obstacles as a result of this sort of advocacy, but um, number one, in many cases, those obstacles are overstated and can be worked and can be effectively worked through. And number two, and this goes to your question, you've got to take the longer view. And the longer view suggests that you know if if political leaders have a full appreciation of the ramifications and the potential implications of abusing the rights of, this, of their of their citizens they will be deterred over time. 
I, I, my own view is there's something to that second argument. The problem is that argument is most effective when the international institution in question is seen as very robust and very powerful um, and capable of doing its stated job. And in that respect, I think many would argue, well, the ICC you know, doesn't have any troops behind it, uh, is not widely accepted, especially by African leaders who have opposed the Bashir indictment. So that's, you know, that's the debate. That's the debate. Um, I have said publicly, and I, I, I don't think, you know, I think that, um, I think there are times when humanitarians, when for the sake of humanitarian access or for the sake of the well-being of the people you're trying to serve, um, you have to be prudent and careful and maybe, you know, choose your human rights battles carefully. But on balance, you know, I, my own view is that um, that um, advocacy has got to be part of our work, uh, part of the work of humanitarians and uh, in principle. That, that it's important because, A, it, it, it sends a message to governments that the world is watching. It keeps faith with victims of abuses. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and it, um, um, and, and, and it, it also sheds a light on situations that might be god-awful. And by shedding a light on those situations, you create opportunities to help even humanitarian, you know, uh, help through humanitarian assistance. So, you know, on balance, my view is that you can't um, abandon advocacy, um, um, but I think there, you know, there are real issues that are being debated here. Hi, uh, my name is Christopher Lee. I'm a student here at the School of Public Health. I wanted to thank you so much for your very thoughtful talk and also your very inspiring career, particularly in the domain of protection with UN agencies and otherwise. Um, and I was wondering sort of, you know, as someone who's, you know, worked with UNHCR and OHCHR, um, and then coming into sort of the State Department Bureau of um, the PRM Bureau, um, I was I was sort of picking up on, on something you mentioned that uh, Chris Byer had done in terms of being able to check the human rights box and the humanitarian box at the same time. And sort of what I'm thinking of is, um, what the relationship that PRM might have with other state agencies like DHS in terms of um, how the protection mandate of, of your bureau might be compromised by other agencies. And maybe to provide an example, um, in the recent Haitian earthquake in January, Secretary um, for the Department of Homeland Secur uh, Security, Janet Napolitano, issued sort of a warning to Haitians while she was offering temporary protected status that humanitarian assistance was being provided in country, but any Haitians um, who tried to reach U.S. shores would be repatriated. So it seems as though in some ways there's, there's some sort of um, conflict between recognizing issues of protection um, and, and also providing humanitarian assistance. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe speak to that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The problem with your question is I could take it in about 40 different directions. <laughs> so I'm sitting here trying to think which direction I want to take it. I mean, uh, there are lots of answers I have to your questions because I've given it a lot of thought um, over my career. Uh, I think, um, let me say a few things. Uh, first, um, there are cases in which, w w in, in which some parts of the government are pushing on other parts of the government to ensure that, um, you know, that human rights principles and protection principles are vindicated. And, um, um, and, um, uh, and, and I think that's part of our that's that's part of our job, right? And and the analog is, in the in the UN system, uh, you know, UNHCR has the same challenge when it um, when it um, deals with other UN agencies or governments, etc. Um, and that's, you know, and, and, but I also believe that, that, uh, humanitarians uh, in government need to engage these issues. I want to be deeply engaged in the conversation about law enforcement equities, uh, in addition, you know, uh, relating to migration, in addition to protection. Why do I want to be, why do I, as a humanitarian, want to be engaged in that debate? First of all, because, um, I want to influence that debate. Um, um, and secondly, I want and I want to be an expert on those issues so I can fashion, help to fashion solutions that, um, that, um, that address uh, law enforcement Im imperatives without sacrificing protection concerns. And unless I'm an expert in 
the entire area, then my advice um, uh, will get disregarded. I'll be, oh, that's the, pro that's the protection person. Of course he's going to say that. So I think you have to get, you know, one way to put it is you kind of have to get your hands into those sorts of issues as a, as a, as a, um, you know, as a humanitarian government. That's always been my view. When I was at the White House and the NSC, um, I, I grabbed the alien smuggling brief, uh, not because I had any inherent um, uh, love of, you know, how to deal with the law enforcement challenge of alien smuggling, but because I knew that pr protection issues were also going to be implicated. So I, so I, I think um, it's very important. Uh, for me, it's been very important uh, to cover um, that, uh, that, that terrain. Um, the, um, the other thing, the other issue is I, I also believe that, uh, that we need to be practicing um, at home what we preach abroad. And that demands that my bureau and I engage with DHS and with um, um, uh, of senior officials there on a whole range of issues, uh, from refugee admissions uh, to detention, et cetera. It doesn't mean that you know, our, my perspectives or our perspectives will always, will always prevail, but it does mean that there's an ongoing dialogue that, that, that is absolutely critical. your comments about the U.S.-Mexico border, um, being from that part of the country and now hearing from federal judges that individuals from Mexico who have illegally crossed the border are choosing at times for long-term incarceration in the United States because they see that as a safer um, option in one of our jails as opposed to being returned to their own country. And so perhaps you could update us on that particular part of the world. Yeah, um, we just, um, two weeks ago, I just part I participated in a, a Mexican-hosted uh, global forum on migration and development, uh, So th and, and uh, in which um, uh, uh, over 150 governments got together to talk about these and related issues worldwide. But inevitably, when a uh, you know if you're heading a U.S. De a U.S. delegation to a migration conference in Mexico, you tend to get a lot of these kinds of questions, um, and um, you know, and I, I think um, I think a few things. Number one, um, I think that uh, Mexicans and all people uh, have and should and should retain the ability to make claims uh, for um, asylum uh, in the United States, and um, and that's that's. That's um, very critical, but um, but uh, you know, for many Mexicans who are fearing violence, you know, I think that the you know the the answer has got to be, and you know, increased efforts on our part uh, to help the government of Mexico to address you know these 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 concerns, and 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 um, and um, uh, you know, and, and and we are in all kinds of. Uh, uh, law enforcement cooperation efforts uh, with the goal of getting at these, uh, um, uh, uh, getting at this illegality uh, in Mexico. I also think that um, uh, this goes a little bit beyond your question, but I, I think that um, w one way to deal with a lot of the migration concerns coming from our southern border and from Mexico is to uh, move forward on comprehensive uh, immigration reform, which will help to resolve the status of millions of, 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 um, of Mexicans and Central Americans who are in the United States um, but are not documented. And, um, and, and their presence here in this sort of netherworld uh, uh, um, has all kinds of negative uh, social impacts um, and uh, you know, has implications for uh, really, you know, um, um, uh, trafficking, uh, illegality, exploitation of workers. So that is why President Obama and Secretary Clinton have reaffirmed their commitment to comprehensive immigration reform. You know, I, I think we'll have to see what happens in the next Congress.
Uh, uh, my name is Pierre Alexander, and I'm associate professor of health economics uh, in the Department of Mental Health. Uh, I was uh, in Haiti, in my hometown, about one month ago, and then I found there were like uh, some or a few NGOs that were operating. And when I talked to the mayor of the city, and he had no idea what they were doing. So that probably a resource, or because the government is, is so weak, or because they're not taking care of the people. But I, I would like to know uh, your input on uh, how do you think, where then we have to balance the need to have a stronger government, because I think as we have more and more NGOs operating in such a way, uh, that might be uh, um, have imp uh, the result might be then to uh, awakening more the government than than then uh, strengthening the government that we uh, probably uh, trying to uh, get uh, a little bit stronger. Um, I think that the effort to assist people in dire need. Um, in circumstances where a government doesn't have the capability to do so, um, has to go on, um, uh, uh, and and if necessary, can be largely driven driven by or with a, with a very strong engagement and involvement of international organizations uh, and non-governmental organizations. We, uh, in, in those sorts of situations, um, the international community. Um, doesn't have the luxury of simply standing back and saying we first got to build capacity. However, having said that, um, that effort, there, the local building of local capacity, one of the, as I think as I may have alluded to in, in my talk, one of the major findings of the tsunami response, uh, the Asian tsunami response, is the building of local capacity has got to go hand in hand with the humanitarian relief effort. It's got to happen simultaneously. Um, working with governments to increase their ability to manage relief and reconstruction efforts. And I don't believe, I don't believe that the international community, international organizations, I don't believe we do that particularly well. And, and so I think we need to bring up our game uh, in that respect. Second point I would make is um, um, I think that there, have been, there has been progress. I don't know how many of you know about the UN cluster system uh, which was established several years ago to try to enhance the integration of the international community's response to humanitarian crises. So they created clusters uh, in specific functional areas like health, um, like shelter, like camp uh, coordination with lead agencies in charge of each. And that was seen as, uh, as a kind of a step in the right direction in terms of enhancing coordination and integration of the effort. But I think, um, speaking charitably, I think it's fair to say that the glass is only half full. Um, and so I think that, and, and, I, and I think we saw some of the, uh, of the coordination problems uh, in the Haiti response. And I think we continue to see those problems. So I think in that respect as well, the international community has to bring up its game. And we're, we're, we're hard at work at that. Adam Richards, currently uh, UCLA Physicians for uh, Human Rights, and I work. Uh, Is Len Rubenstein here? I don't know if he's here. Geneva. Oh, he's in Geneva. Okay. Yeah. And I work with Chris as well uh -huh. uh, in Burma. So thanks for thanks for your comments. Sure. In increasingly, displaced populations are finding themselves uh, in urban environments, and having participated in the Mom Project, I completely agree that one solution, certainly in rural areas, is to bring services to people, but. In urban environments, there's often lots of services that are available, but perhaps not to those populations. I was wondering if you could reflect on how PRM is responding to this really monumental shift in you know, refugee and IDP. This is a, this is a major area of focus and concern for the Bureau. And uh, we're working, as we like to do, we're working very closely and through uh, UNHCR because of our conviction that on these humanitarian uh, um, uh, uh, issues, we can have lots of bright ideas and lots of uh, good solutions, but unless they are uh, channeled through uh, international, the, the international humanitarian organizations with the responsibility to manage these sorts of questions, then they're not going to stick. 
WR, WR thing. And so working very close with UNHCR on, on, um, on urban refugee strategies, which, in, which have to include the elements of which, some elements of which have to include, number one, um, working much more closely with uh, host governments uh, to uh, e explore making basic services more widely available without, without um, uh, A, uh, unduly taxing their own resources, and B, without uh, conferring on the beneficiaries status that, legal status that the host governments just are not prepared to confer. And we're involved in those kinds of dialogues already, conversations with governments, um, you know, uh, around the world, including in Thailand, um, where there is a huge um, uh, population of Burmese who aren't in camps. Um, so that's one answer. The other answer, another, another element is, uh, is um, uh, you know, making resources in urban areas um, accessible to um, uh, uh, displaced uh, communities, but, you know, not having to bring it to them, but having them <laughs> come to it. Um, but we're looking at, at, at all of these issues because you're absolutely right. Um, uh, um, from, you know, Mesat to Eastleigh uh, in Kenya, the world, uh, the world of, uh, of, uh, of assisting uh, refugees and displaced persons is changing very radically. I think everyone wants to go to dinner already, right? It's time, yeah, Eric, six o'clock. Thank you so much. Uh, please join me again in thanking. Thank you.